working hard every time. And I made my own project uh, for the last um, for the last uh, couple of years. I started to study body language of the referees, and uh, I understood that this is really an interesting uh, topic, and that can really help me to grow as a referee. So tonight, I would like to share all information that I went through. And uh, by doing this, it will help you. And I hope that each of you will take one or two things from this lecture and you will be happy after this one. And uh, you will use this in your, in, your, in your officiating and also with the coaches. So I will share my screen and we can start. So um, everybody can see my screen? Yes, yes. I know. Yes. So uh, today we will go. We will speak about body language. I will come tell about a little bit about the theory, how we come to the court, how we meet with the players and coaches, what we do when we stand there twenty minutes before the game, uh, why it's important to warm up before the game, jump ball, just how to be really uh, focused on the things. Um, how we can communicate with coaches and how we can communicate with players. I will give you my personal tips that uh, you can use in the games, uh, communicating with coaches and players. Uh, how we stand during the timeouts and how we communicate with between us, what is important. Uh, then I will speak about the free throws. Um, I will show you a couple of videos, what is important, where to stand during the free throws reaction to the players after the call, how you can stop them, uh, how we work with the signals and how much I work with my signals. Um, we will speak about emotional calls and um, emotional calls, um, one of really important things, how we can calm the situation down, <coughs> not to put the fire on. Uh, we will speak about the hard fouls and our reaction and uh, uh, maybe you have seen my games. I am always in the middle of the fight, and I study this a lot. And uh, I will show you the technique uh, when the players are fighting, and uh, what is uh, important, and uh, what you should use and do when they are fighting, and how you can stop them without hurting yourself. So let's go with the theory a little bit. So uh, for us as a basketball referees, is very important that we. Uh, communicate with our body and it's much more important than uh, our words what we say and uh, I found that the scientists said that they, this is, is important how we look when we were speaking not what we said so uh, for the look this is uh, I always say for the young officials I believe is not important for you because uh, for your uniform it must be the best possible way uh, you know, clean and tie, tie so that nobody can say something for your uniform. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the first impression and uh, all the way you, how you look during uh, your, your, your speaking with the, with the players and coaches. Um, for us, when we speak with the players and coaches or even between us and we have uh, microphones, this was another thing that um, uh, was bothering many referees that we don't know how to speak and we use a lot of uh, bad language. Uh, we use, uh, you know, some words that should not be used. And uh, I always say that uh, anytime you communicate with a player, coach or your partners, communicate in the way that somebody is listening to you on the microphone. So use professional language as much as possible. And uh, when somebody is listening to you, because now the microphones are on the floor, it's not important that the microphones is on you. They can put the microphones on the, on the court on, in different places and they can listen to you, what you are speaking. They are so strong. So my advice from this, all this, that you practice your language without bad language and uh, when you communicate, just imagine that somebody is watching you all the time. So when we come to the court, um, come to the court uh, with, you need to get the feeling like you come to the court in suit and tie. 
this is I learned and I understood that this is really, uh, then you come to the court and your feeling is totally different because the coaches, when they come to the court, they feel, uh, you know, proud of what they are doing. They feel strong. So this is the way how we can come. Imagine that you come on the court when you are in the student tie. So it will help you in the way of thinking of presenting yourself to be more solid coming to the court. When you come to the court and meet the coaches and players, always look to the eyes, shake the hand. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of relations you have. Uh, if uh, you always be professional from the beginning to the end as much as possible. And uh, I understand that in many countries, also in my country, there are some players and coaches who do not want to meet with you or shake the hand or something can happen. Uh, from your side, be as much professional as, uh, as possible. So you put all the responsibility on the side of the managers or the coaches yeah. so but from your side always be as much as, as professional as possible so standing 20 minutes before the game uh, my recommendations for the for the hands because i was uh, studying the body language uh, so how we should uh, look and how we should look uh, much more confident so this is um and the man in the blue is the best one. I would like to say that I try on myself to do this. And it helped me a lot to control myself because uh, in the gyms when I go, there are usually 20,000 people, crazy spectators, and um, they know my name. Uh, they shout my name. They shout many referees' names and uh, they try to disturb you as much as possible. So there are some tricks that I use to calm down and really this, uh, this position helps me to calm down. Um, but um, the other thing that helps me to be in the game and to feel comfortable is warming up on the court. I warm up on the court. Uh, uh, my time is from uh, 14 to 11 minutes. When it's showing up uh, 14, I ask my partners that I would like to warm up for three minutes. I warm up before to come to the court. Uh, and it's, uh, I ask that we finish the pregame half an hour before the tip off. And from 30 minutes to 23, 22, 22 minutes, this seven, eight minutes is only for myself and I prepare myself uh, physically. I run, I do some sprints, uh, I do some exercises, stretching, so I prepare myself. When we come to the court, I uh, communicate with my partners. I ask what is the best time for you, uh, what is the best time for you, and um, I, I prefer that I run from 14 to 11, and this is my time. This is my time. Why we do this? Because nobody see you in the in the corridor that you run in the corridor in the or in your locker room, and the the people do not see you as an athlete. We are so now we need to be really athletes, and um, if we want to be on the same speed with the players, and um, to warm up is just to avoid injuries before the game. If we, uh, we are going with the heart rate on the same speed, with three minutes is possible without any problems. I go usually uh, to the level of the maximum heart rate that I have in the game. I have uh, statistics for the last two years that I have from all my games. And I keep this, that in, before the, in the, during these three minutes, I need to run... Uh, faster, faster and faster. And in three minutes, I really reach this and I feel very comfortable in the game to start the game. So uh, when we come to the jump ball, um, I found myself, because when I started to be a crew chief in the games, I found myself that I look nervous on the court and I try to understand why I look nervous on the court. And uh, the problem was that uh, I was trying to find the place uh, before the, the situation develop, developed. So um, um, then I started to do, to make the jumbo. Then I stepped back two, three meters 
and I stay there just to understand where the situation goes. And then I move to my correct place. For the other two guys, uh, Empire 1 and Empire 2, there is only one possibility for both of them to run to one side because they run to the one baseline. And this is very important to understand mentally that if there is a fast break uh, to my side, I have to be on the baseline very quickly. It's not that uh, uh, you are looking for the ball. You can, uh, during the jumbo, you can move to your side and understand if the, develop, if the fast break goes to my side, I run very quickly and expect and uh, receive the play. So this is just mentally to be ready for this uh, fast break. Because in the beginning, if we miss uh, any situation, the foul in the first action, then the coaches will immediately start to communicate with us and protest. And this is not the good beginning of the game because we were not mentally ready and uh, we didn't. We just forget that we have to run to the one or the other side. So this is uh, written down uh, that we need to find the space and we wait and we're mentally ready for run to one side. So now we will go to communicate with coaches and how we communicate with the coaches. Uh, I will tell you that in the EuroLeague last year, uh, we were allowed and uh, we were, the, the EuroLeague suggested us to communicate with coaches by names. We could say Zelko, Pablo, uh, Ettore, uh, we call them by names. Also, before I was calling uh, the coaches by names because I found out this from my experience when I officiated uh, my first game uh, in the World Cup uh, 2010 uh, in Turkey. And I was officiating the team of the United States. Uh, the coach was uh, uh, calling me by my name. Uh, the coach was Mike Krzyzewski and he said, uh, Olex, uh, nice to meet you. If you have any questions, call me Mike. I was, uh, I was out. I, I didn't understand how, how I can call him Mike, not uh, Mr. Coach or Mr. Krzyzewski. He said, no, 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 call me Mike. And from uh, that time, I understood that um, uh, I didn't understand how he knows my name, but uh, then I... Uh, I spoke with American referees and they explained me that they are preparing for every game. They have my picture, they have my name, and it uh, uh, is the way how they approach people in the professional, uh, in the professional level. So this is my recommendations. If, uh, recommendation. If you have a chance, you communicate with the, play, uh, with the coaches by names and uh, how far we can go and uh, how we go with the signals with the coaches. Uh, we avoid any pointing with the fingers. We'll go through uh, these pictures, but uh, first um, remember that we never cross the team bench area and we never go to the team bench area uh, as referees. We always stay outside this area because um, I call this the bench area, I call the, co the house of the coach. He is the boss there. If you go there, he feels much more powerful than, than uh, that, that it's needed and then you want this to be. You communicate with him and you tell, you, you set the distance between you, uh, the coach and him. So uh, I would like that we don't touch anyone uh, we don't go so close to the coach. Um, if we communicate, try to be more sidelined. So then it's much more, and you look to the to the to the court. Um, uh, you always can put uh, uh, and don't allow. If somebody is touching you, you can say, "Please, uh, uh, we can communicate, but don't put uh, the hands or don't touch me." So um, with this picture, I love because the coach is counting uh, something. And um, I always say one saying to the, co to the coach that I'm not mathemat mathematician, that uh, I don't count the fouls. I, 
by the way, I, I am, I have a de degree in um, economics. Uh, I am master in economics. I, I know how to count and I count everything. But every time I tell them that I'm not mathematician uh, to count the files. Um, so I use open palms. I like this picture because uh, really open palms to explain something and to listen to the coach. And when you put something on your body, when you communicate with coaches, just uh, stay the way how you feel comfortable when you put your hand anywhere. And it should be your way how you feel comfortable. And you need to try different ways how you feel comfortable. I, uh, I feel more comfortable in this way. I don't put my hand on the, on the, on the hip. Um, coaches is always trying to, uh, how to say, to kick out, uh, to tell you the story, uh, to tell you the story about the, how good you are and how bad are your partners. But they are doing this with uh, all the referees, all three of the referees. So um, feel as a team with the referees. Um, and uh, protect your partners. Uh, if there is something bad, he says, coach, is my team. And uh, they will laugh about uh, different people, so just be aware about this. Um, on the picture on the left, uh, not don't try to push anyone, just uh, when the, somebody is coming on you, step back and uh, then what I'm doing, what I'm doing, I'm usually checking the line what, uh, uh, which uh, the coach is crossing. So he's, uh, he knows that he's uh, going against the law, against the rules. And um, this is my tactics, how I can communicate with him because I don't communicate. We can communicate, but we need to be our, in our boxes, first of all. And... Uh, if you come to me in a very aggressive way, I step back uh, and I can turn around, give a technical foul and go away. But I would like to, um, I would love to, uh, to fix the problem if we have this. And uh, I would do everything possible that um, we can really fix this problem. Uh, pointing the finger is the one thing that uh, I really understood is uh, very important that we cannot do. Because one time uh, you do this, the coach will use the same for the, <laughs> the, is the same coach, but now he's using against the other referee. I can point this to my dog, but not to the people where they should uh, go and do. So it's the same, communicating, don't try to be stronger than the coach because uh, you have different uh, tools to communicate you can step back and uh, you don't need to show how strong you are with uh, anyone so but now communicate with players is absolutely different um, and uh, from my experience, I can tell that um, in all leagues, in all, all the players, they want the same uh, communication level as you give in all competition. And um, uh, when I communicate with players in the EuroLeague, I communicate with the players in my local league in Latvia the same way. And uh, some players are really surprised but they get used to this and they understand that they can talk to me and uh, they can talk to me in a very professional level. And uh, I don't say um, lies. If I made a mistake, I say to the coach or the player, I, I, I miss this. And um, the good coaches, they understand. They said, okay. Also the players, they can understand. With the players, is even better because with the players, you can miss something. For example, the foul on the rebound that was not important. But you can say to the player about this situation, hey, you just hold the foul. You, I just uh, didn't call you the foul. Uh, 
that was not important for the game, but don't hold him. I always communicate with players before I call them something. Um, when we spoke with, uh, speak with the players, I try to be open. I ask them not to wave, not to show anything, any signals that I would like. I would, uh, I would communicate with you, but don't show me anything. I don't cross the arms because really they then they think that I'm I feel very um, defensive from the, from the outside. Uh, you remember the guy who was communicating with the coach with the all open palms. This is the same referee who is uh, communicating in the very very good way. I like this uh, his really style. Uh, the face impression is important. So. Um, don't laugh at any coach or player or uh, don't show them sarcastic face because they understand everything is the same uh, uh, with the coaches and players that when they show something sarcastic or they are trying to applause to you 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 are ready to give a technical foul so this is the same also on us that we should be as much as professional as possible um, and da -da. Uh, this one is important that we don't try the same as with the coaches. We don't try to show who is stronger, who is better. Avoid any communication like this because that's, this can hurt you. And uh, this is not that you should stay. You just walk away, you stay back. It's not that um, you will fight with them. They are much stronger and uh, they don't feel at the, the, the adrenaline that they have at, the same, at this moment is not that you can fight with them and is not needed because um, um, I, I like to be diplomatic with the players and with the coaches. So I would step back and I will show you some, uh, some tips. Um, uh, later on, uh, I have some uh, some pictures where I can show you how you can stop the players of uh, communicating. So now, when we go to communication with the players with aggressive signals, is the same like uh, with the coaches that we don't show any finger because they really hate this and uh, they don't like anyone. It doesn't matter which level the player is, uh, lower level or professionals, nobody likes this kind of communication. Now, uh, timeouts. It's um, uh, one of the topics when you want uh, really to share with uh, your partners um, information that is important for the game. So what is important, uh, some things. We open our body, we say what, we, what, we, what happened, we share with the opinion, you listen to the partners, don't touch the partners. I have experience with uh, veteran officials who, are, who like to do uh, this. And I hate this because uh, I felt like a small kid and they felt like uh, like a father. So in this case, I I try to check my shoes, and I go down to check my shoes, and then uh, when I stand up, I go um, just a half meter backwards so they cannot put the hand on me, because I hated this, and uh, I did this a lot of times actually in my career, and uh, then people recognized. And we had some communication and I said, I don't really like that somebody's putting the hand on me. And I asked not to do this. But uh, if somebody is really doing this with you and you feel not comfortable, this is the way how you can avoid this. Just shoe, check your shoelaces and then step back a little bit. So other things uh, when you speak, don't close your mouth because you cannot understand clearly what we speak. And if you don't understand something, ask. We had a situation with uh, Carl Jungebrand when uh, the third referee didn't understand anything. 
And he said only on the question, he said yes. And then after the game, we discussed this and he said, um, I didn't understand what you asked me, uh, but you asked, you answer yes. Yes, yeah, I answer yes, because it's easier. Just like, yes, go away. Yes, yes, yes. So if you didn't understand something, ask clearly, because it's important that we are on the same page with the other officials. So as I said, we don't close the mouse. Uh, when we communicate not using the hands, this is very good professional uh, communication. We don't show how big fish you catch because you don't need addi additional attention to yourself. You listen, you are very open, you don't hug and go around somebody and you can uh, put a hand on you to say, believe me or trust me. This is what I learned from the Greek officials. They are using this a lot and uh, I really like this. I use this a lot if somebody is saying, also communicating with uh, coaches and players. I said, trust me, I see this or I, it's my mistake. So the way you do this is really acceptable. You can try this. I, I, I would recommend you to try this. Uh, this really good tip. Uh, these guys have problem because they don't want to communicate with between them. They are trying to find the bigger Lego. Good communication, good listening. And now free throw position. I have sent you, um, uh, okay, I will show you the video. I hope it will be working okay. I just uh, stop sharing this and I will go to um, different screen. Okay, so uh, I hope the video will be working okay. I have sent the video so um, you will get this video to understand and to analyze if you don't uh, see this now clearly, okay? Uh, what I want you now to watch is the communication of uh, coach and player, the way how they communicate between them at the moment. On the free throw, coach, player, and one player came. Uh, coach and referee, coach and referee, and one player came. So just check their communication. We still continue, he didn't stop. He's still continuing to communicate with him. And now we have the free throws. The referee doesn't want to communicate. He's tired of him, but at the moment he said, stop now. I don't want any more communication. I recommend you to make one big step inside the court. So then the coach would have to scream to communicate with you. It will be much difficult for him. Sometimes we want to say something to the coach and we go backwards to, uh, to communicate with him. That's okay, I do this and uh, I, I understand that this is important sometimes. But at this moment, when the referee is really tired of this communication, he didn't do the job to make uh, his life easier. If he would make this one big step or even two steps inside, he will feel he will take the pressure off of this coach. Look. But he is trying to ignore him. So the coach is around him all the time. Another way is... Um, is another coach... who is communicating after the technical foul to, uh, to the referee. The referee under the basket. There is one referee close, trying to understand, to say, stop, it's enough. 
he is still communicating and trying to protest. And I want you to see the way how the finally the referee will finish this. The coach cannot still accept uh, the situation, so they will give additional free throws. And now check the referee who said, that's it. No more. Finish. And uh, you can try this, uh, the body language. It's not an uh, aggressive way. It's really a very professional, very good way of uh, communication with the, uh, with the coach. And I would suggest you to use this. If uh, to try to use this way of communication when you are not involved in the situation because this referee was not involved in the foul or technical foul and he was the the one who was not involved so you can try to communicate the with the coach who is not he doesn't who doesn't agree with the decision you can communicate with him and to say what you uh, when when you can say stop that's enough um, talking about Communication, there is another one, communication with the player. Um, I will show you the big one. So um, I will show you the referee, two referees. Um, the first one who is touching the, ref the player and he is getting crazy. And there is another referee who is coming and asking for the ball just to get the ball and he is much more better communicator than anyone in this crew just check these uh, referees number 42 referee number 42 first of all he was pointing the with a finger to the face of the player and he doesn't like that somebody is pushing him or touch him so he put the hand off and there is another referee coming what he's doing asking for the ball look Look his uh, reaction afterwards. He doesn't care about the ball. His problem is the player and he wants him to calm down. The ball will come. The ball will come is not the most important. If you understand what I'm meaning about uh, the point, pointing with a finger to the face of the referee, of the player, this is the one. Try to avoid this as much as possible. And then again, the the really the master of this, uh, who was uh, asking for the for the ball, is really beautifully, beautifully. He was uh, managing the the the. The other one is not even trying to touch the uh, the player he doesn't want to touch him so let's change um, back to our presentation okay so the free throws is written uh, one big step um, additional to the lead referee on the free throws um, I tell to the younger uh, to the young players, or even to any one of the players who are coming to, to the free throws to fight for the rebound. And this is how I create the relations with the players. I tell him how many, how many free throws are left. And I tell him personally, for example, number 15 is coming, the young guy is coming. And um, I tell him one free throw left, be ready for the rebound now. I pay his attention much more to the young, uh, to the new player or young player, because if he misses this opportunity, when he is fighting for this uh, position, 
or he is thinking that it's two free throws, and then the offense gets the rebound and scores, but he was uh, late to get the rebound, the coach will be crazy with him and will take him out. So what is my uh, way of thinking is that I tell the player that he has uh, one free throw, and I try to I start to create relations with this player. And uh, really, the players are thankful for such information. The other thing, when I am a lead referee, um, communicating with players, I tell them how uh, on the baseline, I tell them how many seconds left on the shot clock. For example, it's five seconds on the shot clock. And before I give the ball, I always tell them it's a five seconds on the shot clock. Be ready. If the defensive player is coming and uh, saying, hey, why you tell him? Uh, I tell the same to the defensive player. You have five seconds to play defense. So it's, uh, it's important for me, for the players, but also the players really appreciate this. And it doesn't matter if, uh, team A or B, I always tell this information. So I share with them and they understand that they really in the game and in the basketball, they appreciate this uh, very much. Um, well, during this rebounds on the free throws, don't step back. This is important that we stay till the end and we help uh, with the rebounds because um, the, when I'm the center or trail referee and there is a shot and I start to go back, there is a foul in my side. I cannot call this because mentally I'm totally out of this uh, play. So I recommend you to stay inside until the rebounds uh, happens. Um, on the trail official, when you make the, the signals to the table and then you are going to the, to, uh, to the place uh, where you go for the trail position, what I'm doing with the partners, I show them the number of the files, how many files should be one, two, three. And uh, I don't look to the, to the eyes of the coach and I don't try to sell him or to show what was the reason for the foul, everything. It looks uh, very bad. I found this, uh, that I was doing this before. I try not to do this. It's not uh, easy not to do, but the way the picture, the big picture is much better. And um, I start to understand that uh, this is not the way how we communicate with players and coaches. And then uh, the coach, if he is looking at you directly, he will kill you for the one minute and you will be out of, uh, of the game. Because uh, psychology, psych uh, psychologically, they are much more stronger than we are because they have to manage a uh, uh, whole team and all the players divide the time for the play each player especially in the big teams everybody wants their minutes everybody wants to be in the team first five uh, get the ball uh, get the get the rebound this is uh, for them they are managing so many things so they are really um uh, masters in uh, killing somebody if they need. Uh, so, for the two hands, if if you remember, I told that you will use you. I, I will tell you. So what I'm doing, I when I make the file, I'm sure about the file. I stay with the file one, two, and then I go. But I look to the eyes of the player. I use two hands if they come uh, to the aggressive way. So if I use two hands to show stop now, uh, it's uh, not only for the co players, but also to the coaches, if you want. It's not that you show somebody where you need to go with a finger, but you stay with two hands. You can go with one. You remember I show you this and this. You can say, believe me or stop now. I will take care about this. So these signals I would like to use that you would uh, try to use. If you don't know something, you can say, I don't know. I didn't see this. And uh, be honest, because we are not humans. Uh, we are not uh, robots. We are only humans that we can miss something. And it's absolutely normal in every, in every game. 
in the Euroleague I make mistakes. I try to reduce them, but there is no chance that you come after the game saying I have no mistakes. So, signals. Um, uh, how much I work? I work still, I work. I officiate basketball 26 years. And um, I work with my signals still a lot. If I want to change something, I change it during the games. You need, usually statistically, you need 21 repetition. It, mean, uh, it means um, 21 game. And after 21 game, you can change it. So, but for me, I'm uh, slower. I need 40 games to change one signal. So, and I try usually in the game to focus only on one signal that I want to change. Everything else I do uh, as usual, but just one, uh, one signal I try to change. I uh, try to be always very positive. I open my palm, I don't use the finger. I um, copied so many great referees in my life and I created my own style, how I want this to be. This is uh, my recommendations to, recommendation to you, that you copy as many different referees as possible. You try many, many different things, but you keep what is really fits for you the best, for your size, for your body, for your running uh, style, for your style, what is the best. You choose this. And you never stop working on the signals. This year in the EuroLeague, we have started uh, the homework with the referees um, to, 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 to study the signals. So we started to have much more similar signals than before between EuroLeague referees. And this we started only this summer. And I would recommend you that you uh, really work. And uh, it was a homework for the referees to, to show five signals and that we have all five signals the same. So the next year we will have different five signals, uh, how we show technical foul, how we show unsportsmanlike foul, how we show end one and uh, all these things so that they are all the same. And it doesn't matter from which country you come, is uh, the the picture when you look at the Euroleague referees, you understand that this is uh, this is from this field. So, but I recommend you to keep um, an eye on uh, all the referees you really like and try to take some signals from different referees and create your own style. Emotional calls. Uh, what I recommend with emotional calls, um, before I give a technical foul, I always uh, am loud and I'm telling to stop. Uh, and uh, with the coaches or players, I turn my body away. I don't give it to the face because uh, giving to the face, you can really get it even worse than it was before. And... Um, you can say that I, st I asked the player stop twice uh, before you gave a technical foul and then all the other players around are really, uh, they understood that the referee gave him the chance to stop and then they say they will not support the player who was uh, getting a technical foul. This is my recommendation. Hard fouls. Um, my recommendation again, uh, go to the player who was uh, fouled, who made the foul, uh, not to the one who received the foul. Uh, why? Uh, I will show again one video. I stop here and we go. Um, okay, just a second. Um, we will see the hard foul. So, um, uh, so uh, in uh, this situation, uh, the player that we need to go is Westbrook, 
and um, because um, the partners of uh, LeBron is coming to to do something as the Westbrook, they will hit him because they want to pay him something, some to pay him back. So my recommendation: when there is a hard foul, don't go to the player who was fouled, but to the player who made the foul, so that nobody is coming to him. This is uh, we'll we'll see the 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 replay now. You saw the referee, he was running away. Don't run away, stay with the play. Always I say to my partners, if we have a hard foul, we stay there. So we don't allow the uh, situation to develop. And um, uh, when, when, the, when the situation is finished uh, emotionally, so that uh, then we are staying there and uh, we can go and report everything. But before that, don't leave the, the court uh, unattended. So, uh, the next one, uh, be ready for the fights after you, the, for the fighting situations, especially after the hard falls or unsportsmanlike falls. Uh, talk to your partners who, who is doing what uh, before the game. What is your tactics? Use your back. I will show you what does it mean to use your back. Um, take your time before you take the final decision. You listen to all the partners. In some places, we can watch the video now. Um, if you are young and you are afraid to talk, talk in, the, in that time. Be uh, Step inside and talk to the, your partners. Because if you start to talk in the co in the dressing room, is the worst that can happen. Because I think I saw this and this. No, be young, be active, be proactive to say what you saw and say. And for the veteran officials, I would recommend that you listen to the young guys because they they can give you very important information that you can check or that that you can take in your consideration. Uh, talk about the players who can fight before the game because they will never change. If they, there is one player who is fighting all the time, he will be fighting still. And this is in his uh, blood. He is, he is like this. Just pay attention about this. Use your back. What does it mean, use your back? In the fighting situation, you try to be in between the players as much as possible. But... Uh, to use your back is uh, this picture is the best. I did this uh, a lot of times with the big players, different players. Why I use my back not to hold the player like uh, we were watching uh, uh, the situation with Garnet with the finger of the player. They never like it. But nobody is going to push you to the back referee. And then when you are facing somebody, and uh, who can fight with this uh, player, they are not going against you because you are standing in front of him. You are like protecting him. This is one of the best uh, things that I have used during the fighting situations. I uh, learned this from different, uh, from many, many different videos. And it's, uh, believe me, it's working. Uh, I recommend you that if you use this, you will see that uh, how big difference is when you have this fighting situation that you can, uh, you can really um, get out of uh, this uh, much better and not to get hurt that somebody is uh, waving the hands because uh, they will not going against you. So this guy is still trying to get uh, his back again before the player. So, so um, this is from uh, my side. Um, 
tonight I told you all my uh, experience with the coaches and players, uh, how I communicate and how much I work with um, different uh, things and types. I, us I usually work a lot. We have to watch the games, but I like to watch the games. I miss now a lot to watch the games and to, be, to officiate and to be on the court. But uh, I hope that each of you took something interesting from this lecture and that uh, you can go for the, for the next games when the games are coming and try some small tips and things that I told you tonight. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Oleg, can I, yes. can I ask you the questions? questions. questions. Because be ready. I will be the maybe the uh, guy who will the, ask you a lot of questions because okay. I have the deficit of communication with you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you please in the, return to the your presentation in the second or third picture? I don't remember when the crew is uh, staying. Uh, very early. Very early. Very, very in the early beginning. Uh, three people? Yes. Before the game. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I have the just one question, and also it will be the maybe the okay, the good lesson for my young uh, referees also. Yeah. Uh, look at the crew. Umpire one is the ready for game. Umpire two is the ready for game. Umpire second is more ready for the game. Are you sure that the body language of crew chief is the boot here? <laughs> I don't know who is this guy. Believe me, I don't know who is this guy. Uh, he's from Australia. No, okay, doesn't matter. Yes, but uh, um, he doesn't feel comfortable in uh, to be the crew chief in this game. <laughs> he doesn't feel comfortable. And something bothering him uh, with everything, with the, his body language telling you many, much more information giving you when you look at him, is that, ah, especially for the coaches, when they look, they say, okay. Exactly. Very, very interesting uh, guy. I think I can, uh, I can try to get some calls from him. This is, I can press him much more than the others. This was the uh, because I like your, I like very much your two comments. You know about the coaches that they are stronger than uh, we are, okay? Because they are bigger names, okay? Because everyone know who was the coach, for example, uh, in the Moscow Olympic final winner team, and nobody remember maybe who was the referee there. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is one case. Uh, and uh, I have the second question you regarding to timeouts. Yes. To, for example, for example, in time before the timeout, some situation occurred, and we need, okay, we referees need to make the, some warning to the coaches. Uh, it mm -hmm. means maybe it was the flopping something or misbe some misbehavior something. What is your opinion and what is your suggestion when to do this warning? Timeout starts. Timeout starts. And there is a situation to warn the coach for something. What is your opinion? When is when is better to do this? Is uh, the best way is to do it after the game? Actually, very good question. I will uh, put additional things and uh, tricks for you. So um, after the game, uh, after the timeout, is the best way how to tell them uh, what happened and. Um, you tell your partners not to start the game. It's important that uh, the, you finish communication with the coach. Uh, but uh, when you call the coach from the timeout, I never call the coach, head coach. I never touch him. I always touch assistant coach. First assistant coach, I say, hey, timeout. And I put and I touch him and I say, hey, timeout, finish. Let's go. And there are assistant coaches who are active, but if they are not doing their job and not calling the team out, I tell to the coach, I tell to the coach and ask, coach, 
which assistant coach is your best so I can tell to I can talk to him and then he said this guy and I said no with this guy I cannot communicate I asked him to call you from the timeout he's not reacting so give me another one and then the coach is crazy because the assistant is not doing his job an assistant now is uh, under pressure so the next time I come I say timeout is finished assistant coach please he is so much active and after because everything should go through head coach but but to finish the timeout i don't want to touch him because they're emotional they are losing the situation i don't want to be inside there i want the assistants to stop the timeout so i can make the whistle one time two time i come close sometimes to assistant if they are not listening to me i make the whistle strong and they say oh shit i say oh sorry sorry i think you didn't hear me but i do it on purpose because uh, they are playing with me so i play with them thank you okay oleg can i yes. ask also also few questions of course of course uh, your advice and how you prepare for the season and how many time you need to be uh, in good conditions for the season and one more question okay for example i'm this is uh, first season it was for me in fiba i'm a rook rookie and uh, it's difficult you know in the national league what i officiate in my country uh, some details about the body language you know uh, here is i'm like a free you know and uh, in fiba i know from beginning you when you are a new referee in fiba you need to do everything like in book you know and if we compare fiba and euroleague you are more free you are more free than the fiba referees okay up to experience for, from the referees what is your advice it's difficult to be constant you know for example when i use something hand like this or something here in national league it's uh, i i feel the comfort you know in for example on fiba games it's difficult don't use these signals or something and be like like in book, book. what is the, your advice about this these two questions just okay uh when i started in fiba yeah. I received the first season uh, free games and I was very happy. Yeah. I did everything how it was in the book yeah. and I recommend you to do the book. Yes. Until the moment when you come to the EuroLeague and they tell you do yeah. different. This is, uh, this is the way how it should be. Yeah. And I would yeah. recommend you not to change from FIBA and from home because the muscle memory is remembering because in one game you will start to use in FIBA games you will start to use your signals from home that these these is signals and then you will be noticed as not following the rules and they will say ah this guy is not uh, serious he is showing this or this uh, and uh, or he is showing like um, in the other competition Okay. No, the book is the book and it must be the book for you, not for the other competition. If you remember, I told that about the players, they like that I communicate with yearly players and the, the, the players in Latvia the same, yes. that you should be the same. I was fighting five or six years with uh, local coaches for the, for the way how I officiate in uh, Europe and in Latvia. And they say, you are different. And I tell them, I'm not different. So to prove this, for six years, I was running even more in Latvia, even faster, even more crazy to run from my side to give effort so they cannot say anything. But in, when I was running the same, because the, the games are different. Yeah. Here we shoot run and gun. There, they are more tactical, they are slower, and they are thinking that I'm different. So 
you will go through different things. You will go through different comments from different players and coaches that you are getting a superstar now. You can do this and this, how you communicate. You need to go and eat all this during your career because it's a time. Only when they start to accept you and communicate with you when you are staying there one year, second year, third year, and they understand, I can speak with this guy. Okay, he's okay. He tells me how many seconds left on the shot clock. He tells me that uh, there is one free throw left. He's communicating with me in a good way. Yes. So you create relations with all the players. But the players and the coaches, they communicate between them. And then they say, ah, this is a good guy. You can talk to him. So the next time he's a pro, the players who you never know approaching you in a good way. And they say, oh, okay, this is, I never spoke with him, but he comes to me to talk in the normal way. Yeah. He's not shouting at me. So yeah. book is the most important. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Alex, I have a question, if possible. Of course. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier about communication to coaches, to the bench, uh, uh, the guys that you want to communicate to, don't want to uh, measure your time out and assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, one, one, how to say it was point of emphasis. Uh, if coach, head coach mostly, head coach, doesn't have good communication to a referee, Mm -hmm. uh, can he rely on the colleague but without any consequences so this is uh, uh, for example the referee has something against him maybe he doesn't feel well or he doesn't feel comfortable communicating to the coach now coach feels that he doesn't want to continue with referees there are three referees can mm -hmm. he uh, rely, can he ask for a, let's call it a help from a colleague, especially from a from, uh, uh, more experienced referee, for example. Uh, you mean uh, the coach to ask something from the other co colleague? Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, look, um, if, we have, if I have a problem with uh, one coach and um, he doesn't want to talk to me, I don't talk to him. There are players that I stop communicating let's say I don't communicate at all because I know when I try to explain something, they are not listening. Uh, they react uh, absolutely unnormal. And every time they are arguing without a, with, uh, without any way of communication from my side, even I try very hard. And then I said, Hey, we don't communicate anymore. Don't come to me anymore without any questions. And, um, we all are humans. If we feel, I don't know, uh, uh, not comfortable with someone, it's okay to ask somebody else to do this. It's the same when I said that uh, uh, if I have uh, problems with assistant coach who is not doing his job, I ask the other assistant to ask the, the coach to come, the, uh, to come uh, from the timeout. So we can call and communicate with different people. But the most important that we, um, uh, if you don't want to communicate with the young guy, don't do this. You ask the other guy. But uh, when I said that the coaches are whispering to your ear that this is a bad guy, uh, when, I, when somebody is whispering to my, to my ear that uh, this guy is very bad, I would say, coach, this is my team. And I cannot change it. And... Uh, I always ask the referees, uh, do you know who are the best two referees in the world uh, that uh, you, you officiate together? The two best. And everybody start to say, ah, La Monica. I said, no, the two who are nominated for you, with you in the game because only them can help you in this game. Nobody else. La Monica will not help because he's not in this game. Only two who are nominated will be the best partners for you in this game and they will protect you. So this is the communication and this is the job of the senior official, how he can teach the young guy who is not communicating well with the coach or something, there is a problem, how to solve this. 
because I don't like uh, with the unsolved problems to go in officiate the games. I like that we we are professionals and that the coach doesn't feel that uh, when he comes to the court, oh, again, this referee. I want him to come and he knows, okay, this is a tough referee, but he is a good referee. But just uh, my question was just a little bit different. So if during the game something mm-hmm. happens which uh, doesn't allow further communication among coach and certain referee, okay, can I rely on the colleague, especially if it's uh, more experienced, without consequences? Yes. Why not? Please do this. Okay. I, if I'm on your place, I would do this. Because... No, no. Okay. I have a lot of experience with that. I have different experiences. I'm just asking for your opinion how to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Look, if uh, if I I always put myself on the place of the player or on the coach, or on your in your shoes. So if I'm in your shoes, I cannot communicate with this guy. I cannot. If I'm a referee, I cannot communicate with this coach. I don't communicate. Is my decision. Uh, if nobody has the question, okay, Milos uh, asks the very good question, very good answer, and automatically my next question comes to after this. Okay. Uh, all of you sign, uh, you underline this the, in the case of the communication with the coaches. That some coaches are telling the how good you are, the how bad your partners are. Okay, I understand this, but. My question is regarding to the how to manage, okay, I don't love to say the control, this way. how to manage the internal communication between partners. Because Oleg, I remember very well, uh, my last game, so far, last game with you, it was the, in Helsinki in final under 20, you remember this? Mm-hmm. When, uh, okay, I don't want to say the name, but it was the some strange decision from your partner in front of you, in your area of responsibility. I remember, but okay, you answered them excellently with your decisions. But how, when you are feeling that uh, something is going wrong in the crew, and something, the strange decisions are coming from your partners, how is better to manage this situation and to uh, Stop this and to avoid uh, for the next minutes of the game. Do you understand what I ask? Yes, I understand. I understand very well. The, uh, the question is very good, actually. And um, um, we all are the same like players and coaches. We are with egos. And um, I always say to the referees that you need to know the role in your in the team your role in the team if you are not a crew chief so you are not doing certain things that um, the crew chief is responsible for this this and this and he is running so but um, the umpire is not going to sign the score sheet the last or different doing different things so um First of all, the people, they need to understand their role. If I'm the umpire one or umpire two, to the guy who is much younger than me, I try to support him as much as possible. And give him the space, because I remember me, myself, how I was going and fighting with the experienced guys when I was a crew chief to them. I felt very uncomfortable. But I try to explain that this is the the system how they want to teach us and to, that we that we learn how to be the coaches with the more experienced guys. I want you to give me uh, your experience, but uh, not to put me down. And I tell you one thing for this uh, for the comment. I was ex- referring with two uh, experienced referees. And uh, before the game, I was the youngest one. It was my second season. And they tell, told me, Olex, make us look better. I didn't understand what they mean. I said, what do you mean, Olex? Make some mistakes. 
So they look better on my, on, on my mistakes. And I say, what the fuck is this? You know? So to communicate with your partners, you need to be, uh, to be open, to say that you don't like something. The same when somebody is putting the hand on me, I tell him that I don't like it. I say I have some tricks how to avoid this, but I usually say that I don't like this. And when I want to run before the game, I say I want to run from 14 to 11. This is important for me. It's important for me half an hour to stop any communication and uh, I want my time. So we all are personalities and we need to go and work as a team. Every week we work as a team and we need to know each other as much as possible. But it's important that we know the role in the team. Our role is the same. Like uh, assistant coach is not going to to shout on the referees or to give advices to different. The head coach is responsible for this. He is. Uh, he knows what he is doing. So we are not. Uh, we are not uh, changing the roles during the game. Thank you. Thank you. If nobody else has a question, I'll tell you question. Okay? Yes. So, uh, we talked about some specifics meanwhile, but I'll come back to something very general. Uh, this topic, and uh, uh, I, I consider it extremely important for referees, but not only for referees. In every aspect of life, in every aspect of basketball, uh, talking about body language, face palms, and everything. But, uh, I hope you will agree with me. You need certain level of feeling to have that inside yourself. Uh, of course, you need, uh, how to say, theory. Is it psychology or whatever? And you need experience. Now, uh, I would like that you tell me, not percentage-wise, but what do you think, what is the most important? Feeling for that? Learning, teaching during the during the time or experience everything okay no uh, do you hear me now yes okay um so um Okay, first of all is the rules. If you know the rules, you can base on the rules and it's like the, you know, you have the law, the rule, and you know this, and the, the referees are the best about the rules. They are better than the coaches. Only one coach is uh, very good in the rules, Aito. Aito is excellent in the rules. So the other coaches are not so good in the rules and uh, this can help the referees um, to go through. Feeling is uh, extremely important. Uh, how you can feel the game, if you know the moment you can go there or not, but it also comes with experience. When, uh, when first time you go there and it was a bad moment, second time you don't go there, it was better. So you know when to go and not to go to the coach and communicate with him or not. So, but uh, I would go for the basics with the rules that will help you always to go through all the situations when you go with the rules to explain some rules-wise uh, the situations. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. People are sleeping or <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> they they just muted. muted the microphones. We are hoping that somebody has some smart questions more. <laughs> Manu, we wait from you. No, no, I, I, it's for me, it's very clear, very hard because it's a lot of information, but uh, good that I'm not referring. <laughs> I'm happy not to be referring. <laughs> mm. 
but definitely Oleg. very interesting that I never paid attention to those things, but uh, I really so I one love more what you explained. Uh, if nobody else, so maybe there is in the rules. I think that Paul should talk about that, but it's about the language that you are using. So, uh, as far as I know, uh, English is most common, but if you know yes. some language, uh, does it make you uh, like too close to coach or to player if you communicate to him in his native language or the language that you both know? Uh, I communicate with uh, usually in English, and I know that the guys, uh, for example, uh, in Balkan region, if there is a big problem, they turn around and they start to speak English because uh, in the different competition, they are, you know, they are start to use this over and over, and the referee is uh, doing uh, on the way back. So. Uh, my language for me is very easy because uh, we don't have so many players or coaches uh, outside so I communicate in English and it's the official language so uh, but I know that the players uh, if there's one player from Latvia playing in Barcelona he's talking to me in Latvian I speak with him in Latvian of course <laughs> it's not the question and Belosevic when he's speaking with the Zelko they speak <laughs> Serbian so this is normal we cannot go away from this and uh, it's absolutely normal so uh, but the most important that uh, we all need to speak english and we need all to understand uh, uh, what is uh, pick and pop what is pick and roll all terminology that uh, backcourt or i don't know any uh, terminology we need to know when the call when we come to the coach and we say for the timeout, different things for this, uh, for the back screen or something. And then when they look at me, they understand that I speak basketball language, and they appreciate this. This is uh, this is what is important. Thanks. Alex, one more question. I asked, but we forgot about this. Uh, uh, about preparation for, for the season. Ah, sorry, yes. How you yes. do this? My preparation. Um, I usually do it one and a half month. I, for me, it's very difficult because I do it alone. I don't have any coach or... or uh, teammate who can help me to wake me up in the morning who can push me or do some things so for the last i don't know 15 years i'm doing this alone i have the programs uh, fiba was sending the programs for us and the euroleague is sending the programs for us we are doing this alone i go to the to the stadium i run different things and i push myself and it's uh, Everything is here, up here, and uh, if you don't work, you know, I understand that if I don't work during the summer, I will not be able to to officiate good in the, in the playoffs when the when the it's important time. Yeah. So I need to put a lot of work, and I put a lot of work uh, during the summer. Uh, I start usually uh, August. July, August, and I do it one and a half month, really very strong to come to the season. And then during the season, I keep working uh, easy trainings, uh, easy exercises, because we have a lot of flights. We need yes. to cover our body. And um, for example, average what I have during the season is about 200 flights a year. So uh, your body is just killing you. Yes. And you are killing your body, so you need to uh, a little bit to relax sometimes. Yes, thank you. Welcome.